I'm glad you're joining us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. I'm host Carrie Freeman coming to you from Atlanta in June of 2021. And today we're going to be talking about an animal that is both domesticated and free roaming in nature and is often admired by humans but is also used by humans in almost every industry. Food, clothing, fur, the pet trade, research labs, and that species is rabbits. There might be a bunny in your yard or on your lap right now. They have an interesting natural and cultural history, and we're going to talk about that with Mark Hawthorne, author of the new book, The Way of the Rabbit. Mark Hawthorne is a longtime activist who is the author of four books on animals, animal rights, and social justice. They are A Vegan Ethic, Embracing a Life of Compassion Toward All, Bleeding Hearts, The Hidden World of Animal Suffering, and Striking at the Roots, A Practical Guide to Animal Activism which empowers people around the world to get active for animals. And um, the book we're talking about today is The Way of the Rabbit. He stopped eating meat after an encounter with one of India's many cows in 1992 and became an ethical vegan a decade later. Mark's writing on behalf of animals has appeared in magazines and in anthologies such as Uncaged, Top Activists Share Their Wisdom on Effective Farm Animal Advocacy, Turning Points in Compassion, personal journeys of animal advocates, and stories to live by wisdom to help you make the most of every day. His website is his name, markhawthorne.com. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, well, I was just intrigued by your book on rabbits, because most of your book topics, although they're, you know, all about helping animals in some way, but they're very broad. And they're about how to lead a meaningful, compassionate life or be an effective advocate. What made you decide to write about one particular animal species and then why why rabbits? Well, I wanted to write The Way of the Rabbit because I really love and admire rabbits. Uh, I love how gentle they are and that they're herbivores. Um, I didn't have a rabbit as a companion when I was a kid, but after I went vegan in 2001, I decided I wanted to be more involved in the animal advocacy movement. So I started doing volunteer work that involved rabbits. Uh, One of the things I did was to foster rabbits for a local nonprofit called Save a Bunny. And I ended up adopting every rabbit I fostered. uh, (laughs) Major foster fail, as they call it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Plus a couple more. Oh, my Uh, gosh. And so the book was really inspired by them. Another reason... Uh, another reason I wrote The Way of the Rabbit is that there really aren't enough nonfiction books about rabbits. Um, go to any bookstore, and if you find a nonfiction book about rabbits, it will most likely be one that explains how to breed them. Yes. Or it goes into very painful detail about how rabbits are exploited. Mm. And although I think it's important that we have books that show how humans abuse rabbits, I wanted to create a fun book that celebrates their their history and their personalities. Yeah, and we don't have enough um, delightful topics on this show. <laughs> and so, because at first I thought the book also was like, oh, let's talk about all the things that are happening to rabbits. So this will be a nice change of pace for my listeners <laughs> to actually talk Good. a little bit more just learning about a fellow species. So well, let's start just briefly with the evolutionary history of the rabbit species. Like where did they originate and who are their closest relatives? Uh, researchers believe that rabbits emerged in Asia during the Eocene period, which lasted from about uh, 55 to 34 million years ago. And they eventually expanded into North America and Europe and then to Africa and South America. Um, scientists classify them as logomorphs, which to get really precise here are members of the uh, taxonomic order Logomorpha. And that order breaks down into two families. There are the um, Architonidae, which covers pikas, little mammals uh, with small ears, live at high altitude. Ah, yes. And, uh-huh. and the Laparati, which consists of hares and rabbits. Uh, I say in the book that there are 32 species of rabbits, but that number will certainly change. And I was right a few months ago. In fact, I spoke with a biologist at Portland State University named Luis Rudas, and he told me that he believes there are 20 to 30 species of rabbits just in South America. 
Wow. Not the five, yeah, right. Not the five or six currently recognized. Uh, in fact, he and a colleague are working on the description of a new species from Costa Rica. And a lot of people think rabbits are rodents, and although they share some characteristics, and rabbits did evolve from rodents millions of years ago, they are not rodents. Uh, scientists made that distinction in 1912 after they noticed that logomorphs have a set of teeth hidden behind their upper incisors for a total of four upper incisors. Another characteristic of logomorphs is what's called uh, fenestration of portions of the skull, like this lattice of, of holes, which makes the skeleton lighter. Are they related to another like species or type of animal if they're not um, in the rodent family? Well, I mean, they, I would say that hares are their cousins, but okay. um, they're, they're kind of in a class all their own. Okay. Now, I was interested in your book, The Way the Rabbit. It mentions the largest bunny ever discovered by paleontologists off an island off the coast of Spain. Right. Uh, and they didn't even think it was a rabbit at first. Tell us about that. Yeah, the, they thought it was maybe uh, the remains of a turtle. Uh, like a it, huge sea turtle yes, or something? Like, yeah. a, like a giant turtle, because they found fossilized bones. Huh. And uh, th this uh, ex now extinct rabbit species is called Neurologus rex. And um, as you say, their, their bones were found on an island uh, uh, called Menorca in uh, 1989. And Menorca is just off the coast of Spain. And at some point, three to five million years ago, it was connected to the mainland. And these giant rabbits were cut off from the ocean when, uh, excuse me, cut off from the mainland when the ocean filled in behind them and they gradually evolved to look very different from the rabbits we know today. Uh, for one thing, they were 26 pounds, yeah. uh, which is about six times larger than bunnies now. Uh, and they had no predators on the island. So they didn't have the need for the wonderful hearing present in logomorphs today. And their ears evolved uh, to become smaller. Huh. And uh, as did their eyes. Yeah, well, they must have had a good time while it lasted with no predators there in the island to themselves. Yeah, I can, can only ima imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, they still became extinct. Right, right. Like so many, like so many species. Mm -hmm. Now, people have purposely introduced wild rabbits into new territories and continents. I mean, I, it's kind of most famous on the Australian continent. But tell us about some of that history, kind of good and bad. Well, I think the people will probably most responsible for introducing rabbits to various parts of the world were the ancient Romans. Uh, they found rabbits in what is known today as Spain. Uh, back then it was part of the so-called Roman Empire and they used them as food and for clothing and for sport. And they kept them in, in these large landscaped parks, but they also recognized their high fertility. So a rabbit was a customary gift to a woman in ancient Rome to help her conceive. Hmm. Uh, in 2017, an archaeologist examining a tiny leg bone that had been found in the remains of a Roman villa in Southern England. It's a place called uh, Fishbourne Roman Palace and Gardens. And the bone was thought to be from a hare, which are indigenous to the British Isles. But Dr. Worley determined it was from a rabbit, which would completely alter what historians thought they knew about when rabbits were introduced to England. The common belief was that the Normans who came over from France and occupied England in 1066 had brought rabbits with them in the 11th century. But this bone proved that the Romans had brought rabbits to England a thousand years before that. And the best part of all, at least I think so, is that they believe this rabbit was someone's pet and not intended to be eaten since there were no blade marks found on the bone. So sailors from the Roman Empire carried what we now call the European rabbit or Oryctologus caniculus so far beyond the European uh, range that uh, they were found on every continent except Antarctica. In fact, some biologists believe that by, by bringing Oryctologus caniculus so far beyond their native uh, habitat, the Romans may have saved the species from extinction. I think it's interesting to note that every domesticated rabbit today is a descendant of the European rabbit. Now, Carrie, you mentioned Australia. And of course, right. there was a man named, uh, <clears throat> I think his name was Thomas Austin, who in the 19th century thought it'd be a great idea to uh, 
bring some rabbits from England to where he had settled near Melbourne, Australia. And he thought, it, so he had 24 rabbits imported and mm-hmm. thinking that this is going to be a great little taste of home. And they, uh, they reproduced with such velocity that they, uh, that the country now considers them an agricultural menace. Right. There's so many stories of the, like, especially Europeans going to other places and they want to create another England somewhere and they bring all the trees and the species and then anyway, that causes all, all these problems. Right. Now, a lot of us may see wild rabbits in the evening from time to time grazing in our yards or even nibbling on our vegetable gardens, uh, but we probably don't know much about those, those wild rabbits. What are rabbits like in nature in terms of how they live and in what type of communities? Like, I don't know if it's like a Beatrix Potter, Peter Rabbit mm. book or something. Well, some rabbit species, such as the Eastern Cottontail, are solitary as adults, and they usually only associate with other Eastern Cottontails to reproduce. But most rabbits in the wild are social, and they live in colonies with perhaps as many as 30 rabbits mm-hmm. occupying a series of burrows called a warren. Uh, Perhaps not surprisingly, the females do most of the work here, Uh, not only uh, giving birth to baby rabbits and caring for them, but also doing most of the digging. Uh, In nature, there is generally a dominant male rabbit, although with with house rabbits, you know, companion animal rabbits, uh, that society seems to be based on a matriarchy. Uh, Some rabbits mate for life, but rabbits are not necessarily monogamous and mating practices seem to be determined, as far as we can tell uh, right now, by the size of the warren or even how the warren is structured. So you might see, for example, two bonded rabbits remaining exclusive as a pair uh, in small warrens or in warrens that have uh, an isolated burrow that the male and female can occupy. Um, and when it comes to North America, like, I know you, I don't know if there are rabbits that were really native to this area or whether they were all introduced by like settler colonialists, because if you said they started in Asia, I didn't know if they could have come across, um, the top down through Canada or something. I don't know if you know about that. Yeah, they did work their way over to North America, but as I explained in the book, people from other countries also brought rabbits with them. And one of the biggest uh, group, I guess you could say, of of humans who liked to travel with rabbits was lighthouse keepers. And so they would bring a rabbit with them and they'd live on some small island. And uh, if there were other rabbits, they would just, for example, they brought two or two or three rabbits with them. They would reproduce so much that uh, they would destroy the the ecosystem. So that's, kind of like our own version of what, what they did in Australia. Yeah. Now what's, what's with the lighthouse keepers and the rabbits? Like, were they wanting to eat the rabbits? Were they wanting them for companions or I don't know if you know the answer to that. Well, wh- one of the things I do in the book, as I mentioned, is it's really a celebration of rabbits. And I, I don't go into great detail about how rabbits are exploited. I do kind of allude to the fact that they started off as farmed animals and that's how we began to have relationships with them, you know, how they began as domesticated animals. And probably there was a, a, a child of a farmer who decided they wanted to have a rabbit as a plaything, And, and we're talking, you know, centuries ago. And that, that probably got us on our way to, uh, to, to seeing rabbits as more than just a source of food or fur. And so, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it, I, I'm in the book, I'm kind of walking a fine line because I don't want to explicitly go into details about how rabbits are used for right. research or food or anything like that. Uh, but there's enough in the way it's written for you to tell what I'm talking about. This is a book for people who are like me or sensitive and but they love rabbits or they're interested in nature. They're interested in, uh, in biology and history and literature, and they just want a fun book. So I don't go into a lot of detail about how rabbits are exploited. There are other, I, I wrote about that in Bleeding Hearts, my second book. Uh, and there are other books about that. I thought that I'd uh, kind of create a different niche for this book. Yeah, I because it is a little bit like rabbits are so unique when you think it from like an animal advocacy standpoint, 
when you think of like they basically are companion animals, but then also are sometimes considered food animals. And usually an animal might be one or the other, like a pet or food, but not both. So I don't know what it is about rabbits where they could be so adorable and beloved and, and cute and gentle. And we like them as pets in our homes or companion animals, yeah. but then some people you know, also say, well, let's wear their fur or have them as food. I mean, that it seems like that's a strange, we don't tend to do that in society, you know, with animals, they're one or the other. I'm not sure You're what right. it is about a rabbit that we can kind of love them and objectify them. Rabbits are just so damn cute. I, they uh, are. You know, it's, like, it's seriously, food. but, but you're right, Carrie, there's, I, I can't think of a, a species who is more exploited across the board than the right. rabbits uh yeah you know, for food for clothing for research for entertainment for the pet industry it just Clo yeah, clothing yeah for... so many ways uh it's um it's very disheartening yeah especially when we actually like so a lot of times the more you can appreciate an animal for as a companion the less likely or the harder it is for us as a society to also exploit them in other ways but um so hopefully with rabbits, we'll work our way towards um, giving them more autonomy and love um, and, and not exploitation, but. Yeah, and, and remember too, uh, we've only been living with rabbits as companion animals, at least in the United States for, uh, you know, really a few decades. And, and when I, and, and although I know they've been quote unquote pets here for a while, they were generally relegated to a backyard hutch or living in a cage. It's only but because- Not in the house, right, in someone's but, lap. Yeah. Right, you know, it's only since about the 1980s when uh, people started living with rabbits in their homes and groups like the House Rabbit Society were launched to advocate for these animals and teach people how to, to live in a, you know, an urban environment and have a rabbit in your home and have that rabbit remain healthy and happy. Right. If you're just joining us on Radio Free Georgia, this is In Tune to Nature, and I am host Carrie Freeman talking about the book, The Way of the Rabbit, published in July 2021 by Changemakers Books with author and activist Mark Hawthorne. His website is mar markhawthorne.com. Hawthorne is spelled with an E at the end. Uh, Mark, your book also explores some conservation efforts for particular species of wild rabbits in different parts of the world. Can you tell us about one or two of those? Oh, there's so many. Uh, yeah, yeah. Rabbits face a lot of threats. Uh, I'll try to run through some quickly. There is uh, climate change, which has left the the river rhine rabbit of South Africa dangerously dangerously vulnerable. Uh, there is deforestation and hunting, which have meant that the Anamite striped rabbit, a species discovered in Vietnam in 1999, is already listed as endangered. Uh, there is urban development, logging, and animal agriculture, which have all put Mexico's a uh, volcano rabbit under threat. This is a, a tiny rabbit who lives just outside Mexico City. Mm. Fortunately, biologists and governments around the world recognize the importance of rabbits and are making efforts to save them. Uh, in Japan, for example, uh, Amami rabbits live on just two islands and they were being eaten by mongooses who had been brought to the islands to reduce the snake population. But the mongooses found it easier just to eat the rabbits. So to save the amami and some other native species, the Japanese government began targeting the mongooses in 2005, which is also a very sad situation. Right, for them, yeah. Yeah, but it did help the amami population rebound from a few thousand in 2003 to perhaps as many as 40,000 by uh, 2019. Uh, in Mexico, biologists are working to save that volcano rabbit I mentioned in part by educating the locals about how important the environment is so, and to help New England cottontails whose range has been shrinking. Uh, biologists are trying to restore their numbers by placing 13 cottontails on an island near Martha's Vineyard, letting them reproduce and flourish and then bringing them back to the mainland. There's also the pygmy rabbit in the Columbia Basin of Washington State where they've suffered really dwindling numbers for years. So biologists built what's, I guess, an outdoor habitat, you'd call it, for them to thrive safely. And they've released 
uh, thousands of pygmy rabbits back into the wild. Uh, unfortunately, that area had a major wildfire last year, and yeah. it really hit. Yeah, it really hit the uh, the pygmy population hard. So anyway, those are just a few examples. Well, for our listeners who are interested in helping rabbits, both wild and domesticated, what are some things that that they can do? Oh, thanks for asking that. Uh, one of the best and easiest things we can all do is to treat rabbits with kindness. Um, mm -hmm. That includes not participating in the kind of exploitation that we've already talked about. So don't wear their fur, don't eat them, um, don't use products tested on animals. If you're thinking about getting a rabbit as a companion, please do some research about them. Uh, many parents give kids a rabbit as an Easter present, for example, not realizing the care they require. Right. And sadly, many people dump rabbits at a shelter or abandon them in parks and other outdoor spaces where they will not survive. Recently, in fact, my wife and I were walking in a neighborhood where we live in San Jose uh, and we found two rabbits. Someone had abandoned outside. So I ran oh, back home. You like you could tell were they like white rabbits that didn't look like the little exactly. brown wild yep. rabbits? Okay. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Wild rabbits have a very distinctive color and uh they blend these, in to yeah the background right a bit more. right so these were clearly one was white one was white with gray markings yeah, they're just so vulnerable yeah yeah and they were right next to a street so oh, i ran no. i ran back home i got a couple of boxes and we were able to catch them and take them home and right now we're fostering two young rabbits and working with a really uh, wonderful nonprofit here in the bay area called the rabbit haven to get these bunnies permanently placed in a loving home um, and to help rabbits in nature, you can look yeah. for humane solutions to keep them from eating your garden. Uh, for example, you can plant onions since rabbits dislike the smell. Oh. Uh, you can landscape with plants that rabbits don't particularly care for, such as bee balm or cat mint or ice plant or juniper. Um, oh. and, and don't forget the importance of strong fencing. Um, yeah. You can watch out for nests. Not all rabbits burrow safely underground. So before mowing your lawn, please check the grass carefully and look for patches of dead grass, which may cover a nest uh, near the ground surface. Uh, and, and baby rabbits grow up fast and that family will likely be gone within a few weeks. Uh, you can also volunteer. You can volunteer at a wildlife rehabilitation center or you can support a wildlife rescue group. Um, and finally, don't disturb baby rabbits you think are orphans. Mother rabbits okay. know. Yeah, mother rabbits know that they have a scent that their their offspring do not that a predator can pick up so that mother rabbit will very often leave their babies alone for long periods of time she'll leave them in the nest or you know deep deep down in the in, in the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 warren, warren and she'll return to nurse them so but if you believe that you have a seen a wild rabbit who's truly been abandoned then uh, by all means contact a wildlife rescue group but right, you may have to give it some time and wait till the next day or something. Don't just have a knee jerk reaction like, oh, there's a baby. I don't see a, a parent. So I'm going to yeah. pick him up and then take him away. I see yeah. posts all the time on Facebook of somebody who is well-meaning yeah. and they'll say, you know, I found this baby rabbit orphaned in the forest and nine times out of 10, that baby, that baby rabbit has a mother nearby watching and right. uh so it's it's better if we can if if we can just observe maybe come back check back in a couple of hours or but you know rabbits are crepuscular which means they're most active at dawn and dusk and that's when yeah. the rabbit when the mother rabbit is feels safest to nurse her babies and so if you can maybe check back around those times i know that might not be that convenient but try to check yeah, back on at those when times i whenever i see wild rabbits are there it's always around dusk so yeah that's good advice well yeah. that is the end of our show but i want to thank you mark hawthorne for being with us on radio free georgia's in tune to nature program and thank you for writing books that help us be more compassionate in our treatment of fellow animals. Oh, thank you, Carrie. I, I really appreciate it. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to In Tune to Nature, broadcasting every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time online at wrfg.org and on Atlanta radio station 89.3 FM. We post action items, news, and podcasts on the show's website, facebook.com backslash In Tune to Nature. 
The views and opinions expressed on this show don't necessarily reflect those of WRFG, its board, staff, or volunteers. I'm one of those volunteers. I'm host Carrie Freeman, asking you to please support independent, non-commercial media like Radio Free Georgia. And remember to take care of yourself and others, including other species. Thank you for listening. Cheers.